Hello. What's next? That was so intense. My headache's finally gone. My mind is clearing up. This complex, connected sensation felt akin to that of passing the baton off to someone else. It's only recently that I've become aware of the existence of Azai Kiyosuke. My other half. When I, Mao, am not acting openly, Azai Kiyosuke works to support me. This only strengthens my belief that this kidnapping plan will surely succeed. Now then. I dial a number on my phone. Needless to say, that number belonged to Subiki's residence. Someone picked up immediately. You didn't contact the police, did you? Although I'm confident in my ability to change my voice to a certain extent, I still use a voice changer to be extra certain. It would be incredibly troublesome if my natural voice was analyzed. The police might already be at their house, tracing this call literally as we speak. Really? Good. And then I hung up. I'm not stupid enough to just trust someone else's words. I know that it takes about three minutes to successfully trace a call. When the criminals po when the criminal places a call, the detectives can contact the technical staff at the telephone company and run a check on all the circuits governing the area containing Subiki's house. Then, by confirming the status on a certain switchboard, they can specify the caller's location. If the length of the call is sufficient, they can detect anywhere from a general range within which the call is being made to calculating the specific phone number used. Also, if the criminal calls from the same area as the victim's family, it takes less time to search the circuits. But if it's long distance, which requires several switchboards to route the call, it would take longer to trace the number. However, if the call goes by way of the recent electronic digital switchboards, they'll know where it came from in an instant. So I took the safest possible course of action. Just now, I placed the call from my cell phone. Since I was moving during the call, even if the police have my specific location, I'll have gotten away before they can rush over here. This cell phone is itself a disposable model, so it would be meaningless to confirm the owner. Once more, I dialed the number for Subiki's house. After this, I'll call two more times. Before then, be sure to prepare pen and paper. She's probably flustered from the sudden direction. You're not allowed to ask any questions, understand? I cut the connection. If there is a detective next to Subiki, he should instruct her to draw out the call. Why would a kidnapper actually acquiesce to such demands? Anyway, I should change my location. I don't think those short conversations will allow them to track my location, but there's no harm in being extra careful. I'm now near my home. This place should use a different switchboard to route the call. No matter what, I must prevent the police from interfering. I call on my cell phone. Again, I hear Subaki's crying voice. I already told her that questions were not permitted, but I guess she's too worried to care right now. Before instructing you on how to hand over the ransom money, I'll say this one more time. 
I persistently repeated the same command. Don't contact the police. If there's any sign of police presence, I'll cancel the trade and your brother won't come back. Do you understand? Not having the police involved is an absolute condition. Why do kidnappers on TV and in mystery novels always try to fight the police? Naturally, it's to make the stories more entertaining. But in real life, no kidnapper has managed to successfully escape the police with their ransom. No crime carries more risks than kidnapping. If I even find a trace of the police, I'll cancel the trade. That's what I've decided. The most crucial point in performing a successful crime is understanding when to pull back. Her painful cry grated my ears. If she's lying, then she must be a top-level actress. Very good. In that case, wait for my next phone call. I break off the connection while continuing forward. I'll change my location again. Silence blankets the shoreline at night. They ought to be growing impatient right about now. This is the last confirmation. When someone picked up, I didn't use the voice changer. Instead, I just changed my own pitch. Hello? Is this the Miwa residence? I'm Takano of the Special Investigations Unit. Can I speak to Detective Tomita? There was a pause. I focus all my attention to my ear. Well, Officer Tomita should be the female officer in charge of on-site investigations there. I can hear hectic noises in the backdrop. That exchange satisfied me. From Subaki's reaction, it's very hard to imagine a detective standing next to her. I use the voice changer again. Looks like you did as I said and didn't contact the police. If you had said something like, hold on a second, your brother would have left this world by now. The police would never call a family victimized by kidnapping in order to get in contact with a co-worker. Naturally, they're provided with special wireless phones to keep in touch. This is indeed a cheap trick that anyone in their right mind would quickly see through. But for someone in Subaki's state of mind, it's more than enough as a test. That's good. Make sure you keep it up. Though after getting a glimpse of the special gift you should be receiving shortly, I doubt you'll even think about contacting the police anyway. I ignore her question. Now then, I'm going to start explaining how to hand over the ransom money. Do you have pen and paper ready? Now that I know I'm not being traced, I can speak freely. First, prepare the ransom as stock certificates. Copy. Change the 50 million into stocks before tomorrow evening. Buy shares of a company called Shiratori Construction. It's one of Sano Corporation's subsidiaries, and the company which runs your school. 50 million yen should get you 50,000 shares. Due to her experience with diary writing, Subiki jots down the directions with incredible speed. 
After you've prepared the 50 million yen in stock certificates, please have Usami Haru stand in front of your house at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. I will contact Usami Haru on your cell phone with your next instructions. She seems desperate to write this down. These directions probably make no sense at all to Tsubiki. But she'll find out soon enough. That is all. If I don't see Usami Haru by 6 o'clock, the deal is off. As long as you follow my directions, I'll return your brother to you. I'm a professional kidnapper. I'll keep my promise if I receive my money. Do you understand? I give her a little enticement at the very end. I plan on designating Tsubiki to hand over the ransom. But before that, I need to make sure Tsubiki will follow my orders absolutely. After breaking off the call, I stroll down the seaside. There's no one around. The air is quite chilly. The moon gently rocks back and forth on the water's surface. Up to this point, it's been perfect. And my headache acts up yet again. First thing the next morning, my cell phone suddenly rang. Still dazed and sleepy, I woke up. Subiki? What time is it? It seems like Subiki has been trying to reach me for a while now. The sun hasn't even risen yet. I got home at around 2 o'clock this morning. That means I only slept for two hours. What is it? Slow down. Calm down. Calm down and say it slowly. My head still hurt from being awoken by this racket. Wait, stocks? Not cash. <laughs> Which stock? That's right. Shiratori's father is the director of our school. But why Shiratori Construction? And Usami is supposed to wait in your yard this evening? Why Usami? I don't understand what this guy's thinking at all, but I can guess why you called. You want me to take care of the money? I see. Did you call the police? And almost a scream. Huh? Did something else happen? I have a bad feeling about this. What was inside? Tsubiki spoke as softly as the buzz of a mosquito. It was almost inaudible. Hmm. A photo? Hmm. 
したら次はもっとひどいことをするっていう意味だと思う。Yes, that's exactly what he's saying. But hair isn't such a big deal. I thought that it'd be a finger or something. I got it. I'll try to work things out on the money side. Tomorrow. Or wait, today, I guess. We need 50,000 shares by this evening, right? To do that, we need 51,000 share stock certificates. We need to make the purchase before noon. But can we even get 50,000 shares? I'm pretty sure you need more than 50 million yen. I'll go ahead and check Shiratori Construction's closing price from last weekend after this call. But yeah, including broker fees and miscellaneous charges, 50 million probably won't be enough. Wow. To have such a huge family and still maintain this amount in savings means he's really been working hard. Got it. Then we'll just have to get 50 million. Will it be possible? I don't know. Shouldn't be a problem. I already brought it up yesterday. No, from a branch company of my father's. If we barged into a bank and asked for 50 million yen, there's no way we'd get the money, especially not before noon. However, it would be possible if the police were there. Alright, I'll be over in a bit. Please have your father prepare the deed and his seal. I finished it in one breath. Yeah. I'm sorry, but this is the only way. Fifty million isn't a small sum. If you don't put up any collateral, you won't be able to get the loan. The land will belong to your lender. Tsubiki interrupted me. Yes. I can imagine how uneasy that would make her. Well, if you loan money to someone else, but they couldn't promise that they could pay it back, would you still give them the money? <laughs> I'm digging my own grave here. Subiki would loan money to people sleeping on the street. Don't worry about it. This is all such a shock. I'm sure you're panicking right now. I went straight to the point. Anyway, it doesn't need to be asked whether you choose your land or your brother's life. You can't buy a life with money, after all. It wasn't a line that came easy to me. Uh, you have to contact me by 7 in the morning at the latest. If you're any later than that, I can't guarantee that I can get the money. No problem. Yes, 
She's probably smiling on the other end of the line. The call disconnected. I don't feel any emotion. The development of the Eastern District is an important job entrusted to me by the Sano Corporation. That's the only thing I should think about. But still, stocks. I should go and ask someone who's familiar with it. Hello, this is Azai. I'm sorry about calling at this time. Yes, I wanted to get your input on something. The moment I mentioned Shiratori Construction, his reaction changed. It's best to avoid it. Ah, yes. The price is going down? You don't know the reason? Ah, so if the price drops anymore. In this case, getting 50,000 shares isn't going to be hard at all. Thank you very much. Yes, Father wishes the best for you as well. Still, I wonder what's going on with Shiratori Construction. The Shiratori girl's face flashed before my eyes. That arrogant attitude. That forceful demeanor in those pleading eyes. It has nothing to do with me. I walked back into my study. Hmm. In the end, Subiki accepted my help. After putting the land in his son's life on opposite sides of the scale, her stubborn father finally gave in. Ever since this morning, I've been running around, gathering the money. The 50 million was received effortlessly. I talked to Gonzo beforehand, told him my plans, and the collateral was accepted without a hitch. Tsubiki's father took the borrowed 50 million and the Miwa family's entire savings and put it all in a newly opened account at the stock exchange. The certificates for the 50,000 shares should be delivered before evening. On the way to Tsubiki's house, my headache struck once more. Maybe it's because I'm working too much. Hmm. Uh, what? I'm fine. Sosuka? Nanka itsmo to kaotsuki ga chigao yona ki ga shimasu ga. Do I not? Eh, maru de akuma ni tamashi de mo utta mitai ga. My soul was pawned off a long time ago. Everything's going according to plan. The ransom must be delivered successfully. <laughs> Sami, I won't let you in fear. Interfere. Six o'clock rolled around. In accordance with instructions, Usami was standing in front of Subiki's front door. How am I supposed to know? I'm curious myself. Usami looked around, so anxious that she couldn't sit still. Who cares? I know I'm being persistent about this, but I'm here to keep an eye out for police. For instance, if some of the neighbors grew suspicious, there would be a chance that they might call the authorities. 
I pretended to chat with Usami while on a work for an unmarked police car or detective on a stakeout. What, our future together? <laughs> I was just joking, but Usami's face turned darker. That's exactly why I'm acting like this. If we were depressed, how would she get through this herself? Sorry that it wasn't funny. ところで、魔王はどうして身代金を現金ではなく株券で要求してきたんだと思いますか。おい、did Stupid look surfaced on her face. The fact that you have a cell phone. Yeah, Is your mind somewhere else today? Didn't you have a warm up with Mao a couple days ago? You told me yourself. Are you listening? Oh, so this done, eh? Was it a musta? Soka, as I saw must demusne. Soka, soka. As she nods her head, her piercing eyes let loose a bizarre gleam. Ma, say then you to Saki Karazutta, you can't stay in the sun. That am I a one must in it. Could a musta told him a sin. I know what Usami wants to say. This woman is something else. Are you trying to say that I'm Mal? Oh, yeah, yeah. So not so much an idea. So, that way, but what's it? I got kids again. I eat car. Boy, and kill Kananika. The Sagra let it to car. So you can also say my name is Karane. Hey, don't we have an agreement to never suspect each other? Despite what she said, I can only take this to be her suspecting me. しかし、魔王って学園生じゃないかなとか、ノリで思うことあるんすよね。まあ、あくまでノリですけどね。You mean there's no evidence? ええ、誘拐電話も夜にかかってきたそうですし、私と軽くやり合ったのも日曜日でした。That really is a wild guess. Wouldn't Mao have a similar schedule if he was working an office job? ああ、そっか。それもそうっすよね。しかも魔王は金持ちですもんね。This girl。人を使って街の至るところに落書きを残したり。ヒロアキ君を誘拐するのにもきっと車を使ったでしょう。さらに言えば、身代金を株券で要求してくるあたり、相場の知識もあるみたいですね。そんな学園生いるわけないですよね。I can't help but laugh. 
どうしました何がおかしいんですか Oh no, I was just thinking that you, Usami, are a very interesting person. マジっすか自分人に褒められるの慣れてないんで、あんまり甘やかさないでもらえますか I was reminded of the reason for my desire to thoroughly crush her. <laughs> Can we get back to the main topic? Oh, hi, hi. Minoshiro Kyo Kabuken de Yoki Stake Taken this ne. What do you think? So. Don't feign ignorance. You must have seen something in it. Let me see just how good you are. まず考えられるのは持ち運びが簡単だからでしょう。現金で5000万だと1万円札が5000枚も必要です。けれど、株券ならたったの50枚にしかなりません。With only a few exceptions, stock certificates come in units of 1000 shares. If we have 50,000 shares, then there are only 50 certificates. Makes sense. Since the guy's planning on taking the ransom and hightailing it out of there, he'd want the goods to be as light as possible. しかしですね。単に軽くしたいだけなら、他にいくらでも方法はあるはずなんです。For instance? ダイヤモンドのような貴金属の類に変えさせるとか。しかも。椿家のような一般家庭にはタイトな要求です犯人は椿たちが株券を用意できなかったらどうするつもりだったんでしょうねあるいは用意できるという確信があったのかどう思います I don't know maybe he thought that they try their hardest no matter what since their child is on the line Usami doesn't seem to agree 警察が関与しているなら、身代金の工面にも便宜を図ってくれたでしょう。しかし魔王は、警察には絶対に連絡しないよう忠告しています。Obviously. Not too many kidnappers want to fight the police. 和財さんがいなければ、お金の用意は無理だったでしょうね。Mm-hmm. Probably. The culprit must have thoroughly researched everyone connected to the family. Usami's eyes blinked twice, three times, and finally closed tightly. Azai-san. Hmm. Hmm? Kore wa chokkan desu ga ne. She opened her eyes. Watashi wa, kono yukai jiken wa, watashi ni tai suru chouhatsu nan ja nai ka to omotte imasu. Oh? でなければ、私の携帯電話に次の連絡を入れてくるという理由がわかりません。She's right. If he wanted to, he could easily confine his contact to the Miwa family alone. Well, it's about time for me to head out. 帰る Sorry, but I still have things to take care of. そうですか。いつ戻られます I've got things going on until tomorrow evening. So, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do it. Don't say it like that. Even if I stay, what can I do? I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do it. I turned around. Usami kept her vigil in front of the door, her thoughts racing. 
Okay, what needs to be done next? Subiki sat on the fort with knees bent, sighing out her feelings of tension and despair. Her brother had been kidnapped for two days now, but to Subiki it had already felt like an eternity. She was taking time off of school by pretending to be sick. Even though wine hurts like a knife in her heart, she can't tell the school the truth. Her father spoke, a haggard expression adorning his features. Her mother isn't feeling well. When she heard of the kidnapping two nights ago, she fainted on the spot. Three of her siblings were sleeping in another room. When they learned of Hiroaki's absence, they screamed and cried. Even though they've been told that Hiroaki is at their grandmother's house, the kids are sharp. They've probably noticed the gravity of the situation through the heavy atmosphere. This family used to be cheerful, always full of smiles. The mother, physically weak, but good at cooking. The children, always arguing about this or that. The father, stubborn on the outside, but fond of doting on his daughter. Why does this have to happen? The sighing won't stop. This misfortune is just cruel. Why did the kidnapper pick us? And why Hiroaki? What could be happening to him right now as I sit here? If I could, I would take it his place. Even so, Subaki has already decided not to show weakness before either her family or the culprit. Right now, the ones in the most pain are her father who had to give up his prized land and her mother who had to the child that she carried for nine months taken away. Stop. The sound of a cell phone mingled with Hart's low voices that echoed around the narrow family room. What's the culprit trying to achieve, calling Hart's phone? Subaki watched Haru. She brought this hill up to her ear in a calm fashion. Her expression was dignified. She was no longer the Sami Haru Subiki had met at her school, her timid back hunched over like a wolf. Haru suddenly spoke. What does Mao mean? Not even an iota of humor accompanied Haru's absurd question. Subiki, on the other hand, was completely confused. <laughs> What are they talking about? Subiki's mind is immersed in chaos. This interaction makes it sound like Haru and the kidnapper know each other. Having her name suddenly called almost made Subiki jump out of her skin. Haru handed over the phone after finishing this sentence. Tsubiki gulped. She took the phone, still on the line. Her hands were shaking uncontrollably. She asked to speak with the kidnapper once again. Closing her eyes, she pulled the phone up to her ear. The voice was different. This wasn't a robotic voice like before, but the unadulterated voice of a man. It was a strange feeling. The kidnapper addressing her by her first name. Mao then gave her his next instructions. まず、その携帯電話の充電が切れないよう注意しろ。電気やかコンビニエンスストアなどで即席の充電器を用意しろ。ちゃんと型が合うものを購入するんだ。Subiki quickly opened her diary and wrote down the directions. Central街に大和屋という大きなデパートがあるのは知っているか? Facing a sudden question, Subiki sank into confusion. わかると思います。デパートの3階にカバンを売っている店がある。はい。明日の午前中、そこで一番安いアタッシュケースを買え。1万円もあれば買えるはずだ。ケース。She wrote furiously, not having even a second to question the kidnapper. 
無事に購入できたら50枚の株券を封筒に詰めケースの中に入れて私に連絡をしろ電話番号は今椿が手にしている携帯に入っている After writing everything down thoroughly, Subiki finally got a chance to take a breath. Subiki thought to herself, Why does he want me to do all of these roundabout things? I didn't call the police, and I'll give him the ransom just like he wants. So please, just return my brother. The thoughts in her heart slipped out. The kidnapper interrupted her. She instinctively yelled a response. Laughter came from the other end of the line. A voice almost like a whisper swirled around her ears. Subiki was speechless. Not a single word would come out. The culprit spoke again to the befuddled Subiki. I was going to do what I wanted to do, but I was going to do it. The exchange. That means the role of bringing out the ransoms tomorrow has fallen onto Subiki's shoulders. Just when she was about to tell him to wait, she was greeted with the steady tone of a dropped call. Extreme fatigue attacked her. Haru looked at Subiki's face with probing eyes. Subiki flipped through her diary and repeated everything to Haru. Haru silently listened to Subiki's doddering explanation. Haru passed it over as he spoke. この携帯電話はもともと犯人からもらったものなんだ。ずっと持ってたの？私にとって唯一の証拠品だからな。いつかかってきてもいいように充電は絶やさないようにしておいた。そして。Subiki tilted her head and asked a question. Mao. So, Mao. Da. Mao. The person is a person. Ah. Haru nodded. Haru hesitated for a moment at Subiki's question. Not a person. Subaki was. Subiki reflected one more time. The kidnapper's baritone was full of allure, full of confidence. I don't know. She rarely hears the voices of men. The only impressionable one belongs to his eye, Kiyosuke. When Kiyosuke talks on the phone, he sometimes uses an oppressively cold tone, a tone which frightens her into a cold sweat. Almost unable to stop herself from saying Kiyosuke's name, Tsubuki started to panic. His Aikun can't be the kidnapper. A wave of embarrassment suddenly assailed her. If Kiyosuke hadn't helped, her family might not even have the ransom right now, and he even talked to them about the land. Kiyosuke might come off like a lazy playboy, but he's actually a gentle, reliable person. As that thought sprang to Tsubiki's mind, it was accompanied by an image of Kiyosuke's face as he passion he's passionately he's passionately going off about classical music and fire burning in her chest. Tsubiki trapped in a dream was suddenly pulled back to reality. Haru stated her resolution. 
Subaki's father, who had been silent up until now, took that as a cue to speak. The man stood up with great effort. Hearing this, Subaki became frustrated. The kidnapper promised. If they follow his orders, he'll release Hiroaki. Just as Tsubiki was going to question her, her father held out a hand to stop her. Tsubaki, 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 Haru lowered her head slightly. Haru gave Tsubaki a reassuring smile. Usami-san, つかまえるって君が買い。ええ。お金も広脇君も変えてくる。それが最高の形だと思っています。確かに犯人さえ捕まえれば全てうまくいくよ。けれど僕らは警察すら頼らないことに決めたんだ。犯人の言いなりになる
警察は怖いよだって私は犯人の声を直接聞いてきたもの本当に怖い人だと思う警察だけは絶対にダメだと思うれティープへでもはるちゃんの言うことも合っているように思う犯人を捕まえたいとも思う椿だからはるちゃんには自由にしてほしいな椿 smile was answered with horrors ありがとううんうん魔王をやっつけるのが勇者様でしょ Her father also gave a satisfied smile. 明日は大丈夫か、ツバキ。お前の身も心配だ。できるなら、変わってやりたいが。いいよ、お父さん。ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。ツバキの父は、ありがとう。さあ、母さんも起きた起きた。自分も一緒させてもらえると、食費が浮いて大変嬉しいのですが。もちろんだよ。みんなで食べよう。すいません、厚かましくて。The night grew deeper. Even from within the dark, wintry abyss that had been thrust upon this family, a single flower finally bloomed. The morning chill seemed a touch colder today. Alright, I've got a full day ahead of me today, too. Finishing up the preparations for the day, I walked to the door, only to have the cell in my chest pocket suddenly ring. Hello? It was Subaki. It's no problem. Has something happened? Oh. I pretended to be surprised. That's a lot of pressure. Can you do it by yourself? I sensed a steeled resolution in Subaki's voice. I'm sorry that I can't be with you at a time like this. Well, I still have work to do. I'll come right over after I'm finished. Yeah, after I'm finished. I hung up and walked out the door. <sighs> Finally. I couldn't contain my amusement. A smile tugged at my lips. Let's enjoy this little game, shall we? Nine o'clock in the morning. Haru's mind was as clear as the winter sky. Yo, Shitsubaki! Itcho, I want to use your power to hand in the Missetsuke to Yaro Janaika! Haru-chan, Genki, you know? Mue Koso, Chato Minoshiroki Motaka? Subaki was holding the certificates in an envelope, cradling it like a precious child. After waving to Subaki's parents, who had walked the pair to the door, the two of them left for Central Boulevard. Where did all these people come from? Even at noon on Central Boulevard, this monstrous crowd is out of the ordinary. Ne, Haru-chan. Nanda. Watashi tachi te issho ni kodo shite ii no ka na? Tsubuki's stride was getting heavier by the second. Haru matched her footsteps, moving in tandem. Dame da to wa iwarete inai. In fact, Haru was under the impression that Mao was practically inviting her to participate in this incident. But I think I should be able to do it. 
Mao had likely anticipated Haru's involvement. If so, then instead of delivering the ransom with Tsubiki, it would be better to try to hide and pounce on Mao at the opportune moment. For example, the best chance of nabbing Mao might come when his attention is focused on Tsubiki during the exchange. Tsubiki asked. She must still be worried about going alone. Tsubiki <sighs> tilted her head dubiously. Haru put her hand on Tsubiki's shoulder. That one sentence made Tsubiki relax, if only a little bit. A hint of crimson flashed across her face, and she nodded. Tsubiki frowned again, apprehensive once more. Tsubiki must still want to follow the instructions of the kidnapper and give him the ransom. いいか、椿。たとえ犯人に逃げられても、身代金さえ手元にあれば、もう一度交渉のチャンスはつかめる。と思う。Mao will try to contact the family again in an attempt to get their ransom. And after that, a second battle will ensue. This should be true, but a foreboding feeling wriggled about in Haru's gut. One can claim that Haru's speculations are appropriate, but they make the critical assumption that Mao's goal is to get their ransom. To the best of her knowledge, though this crime wasn't committed by a person who needs money. Just how much is 50 million yen in shares to Mao? Still, Haru remains stubbornly convinced that Mao is just trying to provoke her. In Mao's eyes, it might be less of a challenge and more of a game. Whatever the case, if Mao intends to defeat Haru, she would simply have to beat him to the punch. Of course, there's a chance that Mao might kill Hiroaki-kun out of retaliation when he realizes his defeat. Haru couldn't tear this unsettling thought from her mind. Tsubiki <laughs> stuck out her tongue. To be looked into by another gave Haru a tingling feeling. As kind as she was, Tsubiki must have realized that Haru probably didn't have many friends. Her words, seeming to come out of nowhere, shocked Tsubiki wide-eyed. Haru thought of the past. The past where she perpetually hid her loneliness behind a lone wolf attitude in a cynical facade. However, Tsubiki's response was firm. Surprised, Haru looked at Tsubiki. Just why would such a pure girl exist in real life? Tsubiki's gaze was firm, charismatic, even. Haru decided in the back of her mind to do everything in her power for Tsubiki, no matter what happened. She couldn't understand the reason behind it, and Haru's confusion sewed on her face. Haru fixed her gaze on Tsubiki. Tsubaki wa Azai san no koto ga suki na no ka? Eh? Tsubiki obviously hadn't expected that as she blushed her. Dou nan da? Eh, etto. Dou nan da to kiite iru nda. Su, suki da yo? Mochiran. Anna ni tayori ni naru hito i nai yo. Hmm. Hmm. Te. 
So her first impression was correct. Haru's emotions grew complicated. On the contrary, Subaki's mind seemed to have already cleared up. Subaki said, Haru nodded. This time, it was Subaki's words that helped Haru relax. After all, she had just gained an excellent friend. It was already 11.10. Subaki glanced at the clock on Central Boulevard to double check the time. After parting with Haru, she had been on her own, following the kidnapper's instructions by herself. Almost right after the mall opened, she walked in. Per the criminal's demands, she spent 6,000 yen on a cheap Atate case. The ransom, worth virtually everything the entire family owns, was already in that briefcase. Subaki dialed on the cell phone Haru gave her. It was strong in both battery life and signal. Mochi Call connected quickly. The kidnapper's captivating voice circled around her ear. She had no idea what he was talking about. She had no choice but to rush with her brother's life on the line. Subiki could only give a faint response. セントラル街だな。はい。そのまま歩いてオフィス街に来てもらおう。三能物産の本社ビルが見える広い公園があるのはわかる。公園のどこに行けばいいんでしょうか。園内には大きな掲示板がある。そのそばで落ち合う。わ
I sat on a bench, scanning the area, searching for signs of law enforcement. I saw Subuki. She was sprinting to the billboard with all her strength. A girl wearing casual clothes and carrying an Itachi case is very conspicuous. If a person with an overactive imagination saw Subuki right now, they might think that she looks like she was running to deliver a ransom. I checked the time. It's been less than 15 minutes since the last contact. Well then, it's about time to, to issue the next order. However, I need to act under the assumption that there are already undercover police searching the park. If that is indeed the case, then I definitely can't call her immediately. The moment Subaki picks up, they'll be searching the park frantically for anyone talking on the phone. Before leaving, I took a second to look at Subaki in the distance. Even from afar, I could see she was nervous. She waited for almost an hour. Subiku was nearly suffocating from the anxiety. Even though she came to the point of place, not a single person who seemed like the kidnapper has shown up. The only people who have come to talk to her are flirtatious young men, not knowing anything about the situation. Her cell phone suddenly rang. The kidnapper is calling. She yelled into the phone. The kidnapper groaned in discontent. The kidnapper's instructions are what made her stand out so badly, but she kept this thought to herself out of fear. どうすれば<笑> was lost. She searched for Haru without thinking, but she couldn't even find a thread of her game. セントラル街の駅に行け。改札の近くにロッカールームがある。使用禁止の紙が貼られたコインロッカーを探す。ま、待ってください。今書き留めます。Lodging the cell between her head and shoulder, she used her free hands to open her diary. The warning was probably prepared by him beforehand. Tsubiki waited for her next instructions. That's the final stop of the line in the next prefecture. From Central Boulevard, the trip will take two hours. Just what is he planning to have me do, calling me out that far? He used a frivolous tone. He's probably just messing with her. Subaki's unreleased emotions are rising and crashing inside her chest, waiting to explode at the lightest touch. Flames of anger began to swell within the girl. Yet even with Subaki in the state, the kidnapper spoke to her in a mocking tone. She herself was surprised at the strength and harshness in her words. An unbearable silence followed. Terror attacked her. She may have angered the kidnapper. An inappropriate provocation may bring disaster upon Hiroaki. If that truly happened, how could she possibly endure the knowledge that she was responsible? The criminal spoke quietly.
His words only confused her. Just as she was about to ask, the connection was cut. Into a human. Does that have some kind of philosophical meaning? She's never been good at understanding hidden meanings. And besides, it's natural for her not to understand the ideas of an evil doer, of a man who kidnapped a child. She collected her feelings and walked to the situation. Wait, station. <laughs> walked to the station. <laughs> uh, as she was waiting for the light to change, someone spoke out to her. Tsubaki, so no <laughs> Tsubaki had no idea when she had appeared, but Haru was standing by her side. She spoke to Tsubaki, keeping her eyes straight ahead rather than looking at her. お前は犯人の指示をメモに取っているわ。うん。ミッキーに。じゃあそのページだけ破って歩きながらそれとなく捨ててくれ。わかったよ。The light turned green. People began to search forward. Once she got to the other end of the crosswalk, Subiki looked back behind her. Horror was already nowhere to be seen. Even now, Subiki had a sense of resistance to littering. But when she realized Haru would pick it up immediately, she felt a little better about it. Two hours and ten minutes have passed. If one hurried, they should have been able to get from the park to the Sakura Sakura Ogi city in two hours. If it takes Tsubiki any longer, there is again the possibility of police involvement. I, of course, am still on Central Boulevard. After finishing all my preparations, I sat in the backseat of the car and gazed at the scenery outside. The populace ignored the cruelty of the winter's cold, and the street grew even livelier. A panicked voice came through from the other end of the line. Are you there? I hope you didn't lose the key. I gave her the instruction decided upon a long time ago. Come back. Ignoring Subiki, who was in an utterly morbid state, I continued. Come back and retrieve the briefcase from the locker. There's no reason for me to explain. To get the ransom, of course. Who knows? It's clear from her voice that she would like nothing better than to just give me the ransom right this second. There's no police involvement? There's a reason she had to go from Tomenbetsu to Sakura City. Police take their respective jurisdictions seriously. If Tsubiki was being backed by the police, then this kidnapping investigation would have to be transferred to the other prefecture. Thus, the arrangement of personnel would be put into disorder once more. Such an event would considerably hinder police mobilization in this prefecture. Of course, there is a chance that the police departments have made contact previously and are working together. However, police are people who are very conscious of territory, if not quite at a Yakuza level. According to my judgment, the police of Toen Betsu and Sakura Ogi City won't rally together just for a kidnapping incident. Still, it's a good thing I didn't send her to Tokyo. That was my original plan. I never would have guessed that this prefecture and the Tokyo Police Department keep an unexpectedly good relationship. I only found this out a short while ago. That was dangerous. Fine, I will believe you. Tsubiki's actions are swift, without hesitation. 
At the very least, she shouldn't have had time to be in close contact with the police. Next time, I promise. Next time, I will retrieve their answer. I was finally confident that I had done enough to preclude the police's involvement and continue on with this battle. Take the subway to the residential area in the southern district. I'm going to give you the address you need to go to. Subiki confirmed the address after I told her the details. A white car will be parked there. Its door will be unlocked. Take the ransom and sit in the back seat. Wait for me to arrive. Are you uneasy? Does the thought of being in a cramped car alone with me frighten you? I laughed, told you. I was hoping to go for a ride. I'm really looking forward to it. I hung up and commanded the driver to go. After another two hours or so, Subiki stepped back on the central border. The sun sets early in winter. It was already evening by the time she arrived <coughs> right in the southern district. <coughs> it was hard. She had suddenly appeared behind Subiki, calling her name. Haru spoke to abruptly. She didn't go with me to Sakura Ogi City. Haru's explanation was more than enough to wipe away the anxiety in Tsubiki's heart. Haru said these words with a hint of loneliness. The moment she finished, she once again disappeared into the sea of people. Tsubiki felt an ache in her heart. Maybe Haru doesn't even have a single friend that she can rely on. Without thinking, she murmured, If Kyosuke were with me, I'm certain I'd have all the courage I needed. Tsubiki savagely, savagely whispered, we looked to a weak heart for that sentiment. sentiment. Wishing for unattainable things won't bring her brother back to her. Her grip on the briefcase tightened as she headed towards the southern district. She had no idea why she called out Kiyosuke's name. Tsubiki has pretty much never been there before, and the Southern District is, as a whole, a very uh, 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 quiet, uh, quiet residential area. The setting sun has died, and the, the newly built western houses and the metal fences surrounding them are bloody red. Tsubiki checked the address again as she searched for a destination. She saw the car. It was your everyday white sedan. Tsubiki didn't know what the kidnapper's car would be like. Thankfully, there was only one white car at the designated place. Sit in the back seat. Her heartbeat grew violent. She had never dreamed she'd be going on a ride with the kidnapper. He might even hold her captive. Nevertheless, in the end, she still wanted her brother to be released. And for Hiroaki, sacrificing herself would be an easy price to pay. Tsubiki walked closer to the car, trembling as she rounded the bumper. Hesitantly, she forced herself to peer through the window. There was no one inside. She decisively reached for the door handle. Tsubiki slid into the back seat. She put the briefcase containing the ransom on her knee, letting a deep breath flow from her lips to calm herself. Silence reigned. The car was almost completely devoid of sound. Small beads of sweat soaked through her palm. The only noise that reached her ears was her own heartbeat. The silence only made her wait more torturous. She was being tortured by anxiety. The moment she closed her eyes, Hiroaki's face floated before her. Where is he right now? Is he eating well? I just want to hurry up and see him. 
hearing the ring of her cell, Subaki instinctively opened her eyes. She retrieved the cell from her pocket and it. It was the kidnapper. She didn't understand him. What does it matter? How much does the car cost? Subaki had read in a book before that men put great focus on appearances. To her, it was something incomprehensible. However, at that instant, the kidnapper suddenly lowered his voice. His voice changed. It lost the ease it once held. Her question wasn't answered. After a brief silence, the call was disconnected. Yet another unexpected event was hurled towards Tsubaki, still confused by the kidnapper's last words. Someone rapped on the car window. Following the sound, there was a face Tsubaki had never seen before. It stared her down emotionlessly. A hat and uniform. She trembled. Her jaw hung wide open. The one thing that criminals fear the most stood just beyond the car window. Police! Tsubiki sank into terror, having no idea what she should do about the sudden appearance of the police. Her knees were shaking. The police officer was asking her to get out. Her vision was hazy. Dizziness gnawed at her, and her stomach hurt with every motion. Tsubiki stepped out like a mindless robot. When she opened the door, she put the briefcase down on the seat almost subconsciously. The man was repeating a question that she didn't know how to answer. Does this car belong to you? Tsubiki was more nervous than she had ever been in her life as she listened to the policeman's questions like an uninvolved bystander. What are you doing here? Tsubiki shook her head, making meaningless sounds such as, ah, <laughs> She thought she managed to reply that everything was fine. However, the policeman kept on saying, this is standard procedure, just answer. They also mentioned something about the possibility of the car being stolen and other things along that line. She was completely incoherent. She had never been spoken to by a police officer before. She almost wet herself from fear. If the kidnapper saw her with the police, how would she explain? There are two of them. There are also two bicycles, but those are only fleeting images before her eyes. What's that briefcase? One policeman pointed to the car behind her. Can we check inside it? The que that question jerked her slightly back to her senses. A strange sense of purpose began to take hold of her. It was as soft as the buzz of a mosquito. Even though her head was lowered, she clearly demonstrated her rejection. She didn't know when it happened, but the policeman in front of her was holding a briefcase. It was the briefcase with the ransom inside. The briefcase containing her brother's life. If they looked through it, the police would know about the kidnapping. When this train of thought surged through her mind, fear that she'd never be able to see her brother again rushed toward her. That fear purged all of reason, and Tsubiki lost track of her own actions. A freakish scream burst forth into the air. She reached out her hands and grabbed something as tightly as she could. Her fingertips felt the cool, hard shell of the briefcase. The policeman said something, but Tsubiki never heard a word. She was running. She was facing away from the policeman. A yell for her to stop may have reached her back, but not her brain. Fear. Yet her legs, as if they didn't belong to her, but some other animal, kept on sprinting. She ran away, wordless, panting, dizzy, almost falling down. She felt as if she too had become a criminal. Driven by the guilt and oxygen deprivation, her tears couldn't be stopped anymore. But there was no time for her to cry anymore. <sighs> Having successfully escaped and now making her way through the bustling crowd of Central Boulevard, Tsubiki was still on edge. She begged with all that she had. The kidnapper answered with a voice colder than those she had heard before. Why 
頭を下げる理由がわかるうわどうただなんとなく The person on the other end of the line didn't let down his guard. She felt as if her head had just been struck by a blunt object. If this continues, Hiroaki is gone. By the end of her pleading, she was unable to even form sentences. Her eyes were filled with tears. At that, the kidnapper laughed with her. He continued with a mocking tone. Tsubaki understood that comment even less. Everyone always says she's a good person. Kyosuke had even joked about it. But this... Wait, but isn't everyone else good too? She just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> She lowered her head in thanks without thinking about it. Even in this outrageous situation, she still showed her gratitude to the criminal. Tsubiki was beginning to think that the kidnapper is still human after all. As long as she just asks him with sincerity, he'll understand. He might even have a good reason for kidnapping Hiroaki. For the first time, Tsubiki found herself interested in the kidnapper's thoughts and feelings. So interested, in fact, that she completely missed the point when she had stopped asking questions, the point when she became completely obedient. The sun has set. The young winter wind carries a chill. I lean on a railing, continuing my conversation with Tsubiki. After that exchange, I had Tsubiki go to the Western District in a nearby city, there and back. The forms of transportation included walking, cable car, taxi, and other methods. As promised, everything was done with utmost care. The area in the Southern District is already in an uproar over Tsubiki. A girl holding an attache case is always very conspicuous. With someone that suspicious, there's always the possibility that an upstanding citizen might report her. And one can't say that police won't connect a suspicious person with a kidnapping. Still, it would be practically impossible for the police both to become certain that the suspicious person is Subaki and to find out that she's the victim of a kidnapping all within a single day. I will retrieve the ransom today. I left no evidence behind. That white car was stolen anyway. Its disposal has already been prepared. It'll be no more than a piece of scrap metal in a factory in another prefecture by morning. If one was worried about the police finding some trace evidence from the car, then his time would be better spent worrying about the possibility of a catastrophic eruption of Mount Fuji happening at exactly noon tomorrow. <laughs> uh, almost everything is prepared. The only thing left is Usami. She seemed to have been trailing Tsubiki, only keeping her distance. Even though I had been watching for Usami as I kept track of Tsubiki, I couldn't find her at all. 
That freakish hair is completely unfit for following people, but that may be where the blind spot is. With hair that long, changing hairstyles is a snap. With a hat and glasses, she could become a different person in an instant. Yet, in the end, I will be the one to take the ransom. In the meantime, I'll have them run around and waste their strength. Another headache attacked me, but this time I must endure it. I can't surrender to the headache right now. The depression was fiercely burning inside me, igniting my will to fight. I won't let you interfere, neither you, Sai, nor Asami. <laughs> Come on out, now. It's already around 8 o'clock. Haru had been running here and there, all across the city, since before noon. Now, after nightfall, she has returned to the park in the eastern district. Haru hid herself in the grass, not making a single sound for fear of being heard over the silence of her surroundings. This park is a place where people come to relax during the day, but at night, only an eerie quiet remains. She wondered how Subaki was holding up after all this walking. Before coming to the park, Subaki had been told to lock the briefcase in the locker again. Taking one with a key, she came to a garbage can in the park. Haru didn't even glance at the locker this time around, and chose to follow Subaki instead. If someone wanted to get the ransom, they must get closer to the locker, and to open the locker, they would need the key. And there's even someone watching the locker. Haru had run into Kiyosuke on Central Boulevard. After she explained things, Kiyosuke was more than happy to help. Even though he said he was helping his father, he had a surprising amount of reason. Tsubiki's cell phone rang. Haru concentrated on the noises around her. It would be bad if she showed her face now. She could only follow the situation through sound. Yes, Tsubiki's exhaustion made itself apparent in her voice. It's understandable. She's been in a state of heightened anxiety all day. She had almost fainted when the police had showed up. She didn't know whether or not Subaki was doing it on purpose, but Subaki had repeated the kidnapper's instructions. As Subaki finished the conversation, Haru heard the sound of a cell phone closing. Footsteps followed. As the footfalls grew quieter, it seemed that Subaki had left the area. Haru remained still, curling her body into a ball. If she just stayed there, Mal would definitely come to retrieve the key. No, that's wrong. Was she exhausted as well? There's no way Mal would show up. After all, Subaki still had the key. She had been listening closely all the while, but she didn't hear the sound of Subaki dropping anything into the garbage can. Subaki said, So I should just throw the key into the wait, in the garbage can? However, that was most likely something she just said by chance. If Subaki were repeating Mao's instructions intentionally, then she should have she could have supplemented herself through other actions to further detail the situation. She could even have thrown the key in with excessive noise, or made sure to speak out and confirm that she did so after throwing it in. What's more, if Subaki were really repeating his instructions for Haru to see, then the last thing she said, I'm out of my way, would be too vague for Haru to determine where she would just where she would be going. Or when Subaki's conversation was probably something along these lines. Whoa. <laughs> so I should just throw the key in the garbage can? No, wait, go to Central Boulevard instead. I understand, I'm on my way. Subaki has grown even more afraid of Mal after her encounter with the police. She's probably so anxious that her heart is about to explode. In a situation like this one, it's easy to imagine that she, should, she wouldn't have the energy to concern herself with what Haru was up to. That was a moment that decided everything. Simply interpreting a sentence incorrectly could have caused her to retire before this ordeal came to a conclusion. <laughs> Even as she spoke, Haru felt the time of battle rumbling toward her with impatient force. How many places has she been dragged to now? She's forgotten just how many times she had changed locations. Continuously in a state of extreme tension, Tsubaki is puffing with every. The kidnapper was on the phone. 
そろそろ弟たちを寝かしつける時間じゃないか<笑>おいおいクラブ次はどこに、oh. Subaki asks, breathing hard. I died. <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm not sure. Subuki already lacks the strength to think things through. Yes. The criminal side. そういった決まり文句こそ貧乏を経験したことのない何よりの証拠だと思うかな。Sure, Subiki has never seen her parents worried about being poor. Her family might not be rich, but they're definitely not impoverished. The kidnapper kept on repeating questions that she just couldn't understand. These subjects confused her. Just what do they have to do with the ransom? あの、早く、早く終わらせませんか。もう限界か。いえ。ただ、いつまで続くのかと。弟の命がかかっているのに、弱音を吐くのか。ええ。違います。弟に早く会いたいだけです。Utterly unforgettable. Subuki immediately, immediately began to doubt herself for feeling such intense hatred for this unforgettable criminal. But the moment that her words had burst, she couldn't stop. She could no longer understand anything. What happened to the self that was worried about the kidnapper's feelings? What would happen if she provoked him again? I just want to see Hiroaki. That was the only thought in her heart. The kidnapper suddenly spoke up. There's no longer any time to write in her diary. It'll be a stretch to make the trip in the short amount of time remaining. She can only obey. The call ended. Suki kept the cell to her ear for a moment longer. She had never thought that paying the ransom would be so exhausting. The kidnapper said that this would be the last place. Up until now, he said that every single time, and it was a lie every single time. Still, this time feels different. She thought of the family waiting for her at home. Her parents are probably worried about her. I'll be back soon. Hmm. Haru chased after Subiki with all her strength as she sprinted through Central Boulevard. She rushed into the station and retrieved the briefcase. Subaki might be tired, but she still moves amazingly quickly. It's like she's using every ounce of strength remaining in her body. The train station was in chaos. She had no time to look for Kiyosuke, who was supposed to be guarding the locker. <sighs> Haru swept her gaze across the chaotic street. Her line of sight was blocked, almost completely. Young people filled the street like a mudslide. Just how many people had she bumped into it already? The shape of Subiki's coat would often get swallowed by the sea of people, momentarily gone without a trace. This is the route that Haru usually takes on the way home after work, but this is the first time she has seen it this crowded. She noted the reason for this almost instantly. A live television broadcast. 
Everyone who wanted to see Ken on or be on television pressed ever closer to the stage. On either side of the road were cars from the station and staff demanding equipment. This is the moment now has been waiting for. It was so chaotic it was suffocating. Truly an excellent chance to grab the ransom. Tsubaki! Haru wanted to stop Tsubaki to ask her where she was bringing the ransom, but her shouts were lost in the din of the crowd. Tsubaki didn't have time for questions anyway. Mal must be urging her on. To have Tsubaki at a speed he's never asked of her before meant that to Mal, this is the moment where the winner will be decided. Hmm? I'm going to act. It has to be now. Haru charged towards Tsubaki. Tsubaki, breathing hard, finally reached her destination. She relentlessly prayed. Please don't let it be 9.30. The girl pushes through the air, a sea of people surging straight forward, knocking into the crowd. People yell and curse at her. She causes a lot of people trouble. However, she can't spare the time to apologize anymore. She was in a hurry. She even fell down, dropping the briefcase onto the ground. That briefcase, more important than a life. She held it tightly as she crossed the village of people with blinding speed. Oh. Tsubiki stops. She looked around casually. It should be okay to just drop it here, right? They wouldn't be picked up by someone who isn't involved in this, would it? The kidnapper said to put it put down the briefcase and run. At that moment, an unbelievably bright voice shot through the crowd from nearby amplifiers. Tsubaki was speechless, unable to believe her ears. Why is Kim? It was way beyond... Way, way yeah, beyond your comprehension. Beyond your comprehension. Still, she heard it clearly. It's 9.30. If I don't drop the briefcase and run, here you go. Your Oxy is dead. Uh. Now. Uh, at the exact moment, Tsubaki set the Atachi case on the ground. I went into action. I walked through the crowd, closing in on the briefcase quickly. I gripped the briefcase tightly. It's been less than five seconds since it left its previous owner. Everyone's eyes are focused on the radiant entrance of the famous figure skater, as I can on. This confusion is what I wanted. I've been waiting all day to coordinate my retrieval of the ransom with this broadcast. This chaos is what I wanted. Even if the police were right behind me, I have confidence that I could escape. That would be true for one reason alone. I am simply too familiar with this city. I've considered many escape routes. Usami is simply a girl. What can she do? A shout from behind me penetrated the din of the spectacle. It was Usami. It seems that she's been closely following Tsubiki. She caught a glimpse of me. Anyway, Usami. Just how many people do you think are carrying briefcases in this bustle of people so close to the business district? Uh, as I expected, no one paid any attention to me. Oh. Shouting is useless now. I straightened up, walking casually. If there was a thief, they'd be running for their life. No one would think that I was a kidnapper. No, something's wrong. Along with a shiver down my spine, the stage speaker sent a sound to me. <laughs> the broadcast could pose trouble. If I face the cameras, there's a chance I'll be on film. If my face surfaces during a piddly little game like this, it may affect future plans. I want to run right now, 
But doing so would be like announcing to everyone that I'm a thief. <laughs> I crossed paths with someone and took the opportunity to peek behind me. I caught a glimpse of the song as long hair through the crowd. For just an instant, Haru saw the figure of a man holding a briefcase. That was now. She continued to push forward while trying her hardest to break through the mass of people. <laughs> the next time she saw Mal, Haru ran straight into someone's arms. After a word of apology, she escaped to her side. With anxiety urging her on, she continued searching for Mal. There. Through the wall of men, women, and children, Haru could only get a glimpse of the briefcase. She searched forward with all her might in order to break through the barricade of people. The distance between them didn't decrease. Haru held out her hand in a crowded tide of passersby. Just a bit farther, she thought. Just a bit farther. I'll catch you. Now. Decrease. I passed the most chaotic part of the crowd. Did I successfully lose a song? It's dangerous to turn my head around. There's a chance that my face will be seen. The Shami might be able to reach me any second now. Should I take a taxi for her? But with traffic the way it is right now, no car can take off immediately. No, wait, a taxi! I watched the side mirrors mounted on the taxis that lined the streets as I walked. I was in luck, as the mirrors clearer reflected the uniform and hair of the zombie, still trailing me. It looks like she's holding something in her hand. She's less than ten yards away. Oh, the zombie was likely able to get a walk on me in innocent pursuit. I don't want to attract attention, but there's no other choice. I break into a run. Mal suddenly took off. He didn't even turn back. How did he know that she was getting closer? Shortly thereafter, Haru saw the park taxi strewn about on the road and started to lament. Haru looked at Mal's retreating figure. He was a very tall man. It was similar to the person that had confronted her last time, the man who had called himself Mal. Because his legs were longer than hers, the distance between them just continued to increase. Yet chasing him was still quite easy. To run in a crowd such as this means gathering attention. The sounds of the people he pushed, the confused stares, all were focused on now. While pushing her away through idle bystanders, Harder watched as Mal went inside a coffee shop. Like a rat in a trap, Harder thought. But when Haru arrived in front of the store, she cursed her own thoughtlessness. It was a large-scale chain coffee shop. The shop covered a large area, being at the crossing of a major intersection. Of course, there were more than two exits. Even if it was for just a moment, she regretted slowing down. Mal ran in intentionally. That must mean that he knows the city like the back of his hand. Should he give chase? Should she give chase until then? Or asked herself a question that needed no answer. No matter what, she wants to catch him. Both for Subaki and for herself. After passing through Central Boulevard, the crowd began to thin out considerably. I turned around and took a few glances. Even though it's hard to see in the nighttime lighting, the sound of people's insults reached me just fine. <laughs> it looks like Usami is still on my trail. She's quite stubborn. Let's get rid of her completely. Jumping over the railing of the sidewalk, I rushed into the road. I ran in front of cars moving at a snail's pace due to the traffic jam and made it to the sidewalk on the other side. The car's blaring horns are unending. This should help Usami find me more easily. I continued my charge as I turned into a discreet alley. A dark alley. 
After seeing what awaited me there, I knew I had already won. This game of tag is over now. I took out a handkerchief and covered my fingers, ensuring that I won't lose fingerprints. <laughs> Just how many times had she said that since 9.30? Each time she was showered with an annoying stares and condemnations, the thing she carried was bulky. Hard glanced around, chasing after Mal's image. Even though they'd left the extravagance of tentacle bulbers, it was still very bright out. The hundreds of cars on the street, all with lights on for were a very reliable boost for the visibility. The sound of horns suddenly rang out from the road. Glancing over, it seemed that a man who looked like Mal was casually jaywalking. His face was hidden behind the blindingly bright headlights of the vehicle as he blinked past. It was regrettable, but there was nothing Hard could do about it. Just like that, Mal turned into an alley between two buildings. Hard hurriedly pursued him. It was an incredibly narrow alley with a horrible line of sight. Not even two people would be able to walk abreast. Was he inviting me to fall? Even though Haru was reluctant, there wasn't much room for her to think. As she gave chase, rushing into the darkness, she felt something weird under her foot. She lost her balance and fell forward to the ground. It was the feel of flesh. Haru was shocked, and the thing that she stepped on screamed. As she calmed down, she realized it was a human leg. She stooped down instinctively. A peculiar putrid odor filled her nose. A few homeless men sat on the ground. They stared at Haru with lifeless eyes before losing interest again. They seemed to be distracted by something. They were kneeling, furiously moving their hands. They looked as though they were digging, as if they were trying to stir the darkened ground. Money. Haru could see a few bills poking out from under their hands. <laughs> Before he was, she said to herself, full of regret. She looked at her hand and glanced down to the other end of the alley. Her head, I think, I don't know. <laughs> Mal, the enigma from horror, had her sights nailed to, but now nowhere to be seen. Uh, <laughs> escaped her lips before a wave of exhaustion overcame her. The day long battle had finally come to an end. Oh. How exhausting. Whoa, what a chase. Oh, Mal is a worthy opponent, isn't he? <laughs> yes, yes, this is exciting. Oh, what a cool story. Can't wait to read it. Bye!